Hello and welcome to this broadcast to bring you news and views from Deloitte. My name is Robert Bruce and I'm a financial journalist. Joining me today to discuss the publication of the completed IFRS 9 and its impact on the banking sector is Andrew Spooner, the lead IFRS partner on financial instruments, and Mark Rees and Tom Miller, both banking audit partners focusing on IFRS 9 implementation. Before we begin, the traditional disclaimer, I'd like to stress that the views expressed in this broadcast are personal views, and they are not necessarily the views of Deloitte. Welcome, gentlemen. Andrew, it's been a long time. We now have the standard. Um, can you just talk through the basics and also from when it will apply? OK, so this um, IFRS 9 is really a replacement to IRS 39. They want to replace IRS 39 with a better standard. And ultimately, this project started pre-financial crisis, but it's taken a slightly different tack as the financial crisis has, has, has kind of bled through. Now, there have been a number of versions to IFRS 9, so we're now at the point where this is the final version. But there have been three previous versions, that's why it can get a bit confusing. So we have a 2009 version, a 2010 version, and a 2013 version. Now, the first one dealt with classification of financial assets. The second version in 2010 dealt with liabilities. And the third version, uh, issued last year, dealt with hedge accounting. Now, what we've done with the 2014 version is really take all of that, but also made some changes to classification and measurement, but also included the impairment guidance. So this is the new impairment model. Now, the effective date of this new standard is the 1st of January 2018, but there's not a requirement to restate comparatives. Also, is available for early adoption as well. Now, whether you go for early adoption is yet to be determined, but that might be influenced by your local regulators and what jurisdiction you're in, depending whether they allow uh, for early adoption. For example, in the EU, we'll have to wait for EU endorsement yeah. for to apply. So, Andrew, this new standard includes some of the old um, requirements and some new requirements. Could you just try to explain our way through this maze for us? Okay, what I'll do is start off with classification and measurement. Uh, so classification and measurement, two aspects. was one for financial assets and one for financial liabilities. So starting with financial assets, we have a new model in determining how to classify financial assets. And it's based broadly on two criteria. What is the business model for holding the financial asset? And also what are the contractual cash flows of that financial asset? Now the first measurement for financial assets is amortized cost. And if you have contractual cash flows, which are a return of interest and principal, and they're held within a business model to collect the contractual cash flows, then these are measured at amortized cost. Now you have something very similar for fair value through other comprehensive income. So it's a fair value model, but fair valued through uh, equity. Similarly, that has got to pass the same contractual cash flow test as amortized cost, but this is slightly different. So this is if you're holding in a business model where you collect the contractual cash flows, but potentially may sell the financial asset. Now, if you're not either amortized cost or fair value through OCI, you're required to measure it at fair value through profit and loss. Now, that is normally going to be the application for debt instruments. For equity instruments, the position is normally it's fair value through P&L, but there is an election to designate them at fair value through other comprehensive income. For impairment, the main change is we're moving from an incurred loss model to an expected loss model. So fundamentally and conceptually, that is a very different impairment model for financial assets. It's going to be far more forward-looking based than we're used to under IS39. I'll mention also, lastly, hedge accounting. Well, hedge accounting was reformed in 2013, so there's nothing new in the 2014 version. They've just moved the 2013 version over to 2014. Now, with hedge accounting, I guess the main difference from what we're used to under 39 is that it's attempted to be more aligned with risk management. And in doing so, what they've done is removed some of the burdens that we have with IS39, for example, some of the testing that was involved. Um, the one other thing I will just mention is recognition and derecognition. If you like, that's the fourth piece in this puzzle. Um, I mention that only because it hasn't changed. So the recognition and derecognition requirements of 39 have been simply moved over to IFRS 9. Okay, Tom, can you go through some of the differences, what this standard is and what the old IS39 asked us to do? As Andrew was just explaining, the standard, the IFRS 9 as it, as it now is, 
has been split into three main areas. And the first of those is classification and measurement, which deals with um, which assets you fair value and which assets you don't and, and how you deal with them in the profit and loss account. We're moving now from a model where previously you had four classifications of your assets being loans and receivable, fair value, held to maturity and available for sale. Under the new model you're effectively going to have three categories and they're going to be determined in line with the business model that you employ as opposed to under IS39 where the rules are more prescriptive as to what goes where. So under IFRS 9 if your business model is fundamentally to lend money and collect those contractual cash flows you'll be an amortized cost whereas if you are for example trading assets you will have to fair value them. There are uh, a number of ways that you will utilize the third category which is the fair value through OCI uh, and that will depend on again the business model so for example where you hold assets um, with both the intention to collect the contractual assets but you contractual cash flows but also to sell um, you'll, you'll, you will use that classification there are a number of other differences on, on the asset side probably the most um, significant that has not been mentioned so far is the removal of the embedded derivative concept uh, on, on the asset side. The second area um, where there is significant change under IFRS 9 relates to impairment where the standard has moved us from an incurred loss model to an expected loss model. Currently under 39 uh, we account on an incurred loss and therefore we need objective evidence of impairment in order to uh, effectively um, analyse and then book the appropriate provision uh, in our financial statements. Under IFRS 9, all um, financial assets held at amortised cost will attract some form of provision and the way that will work will depend on uh, what has happened to the asset after it has been initially recognised. In summary, all assets will begin in stage one and stage one assets will require uh, uh, an expected loss uh, equivalent to a 12-month expected loss to be booked at initial recognition. Then at each measurement date um, firms will need to analyse whether or not there has been a significant increase in credit risk compared with that initial recognition uh, and if that's happened then effectively those assets will move to uh, the second stage where they will attract a lifetime expected loss. Interest income is going to be calculated on the gross amount in all cases except where you move into stage three and stage three is clearly where you have individual um, evidence of impairment very similar uh, to, to, to what you currently have under IS39. So one of the critical points is the point where you might move from stage one to stage two. Does the standard give you any particular guidance on that? Yes. So the standard wants you to look at whether there has been significant deterioration in the asset since uh, initial recognition uh, and, and also whether or not the asset remains um, in a position where the credit quality or the, the credit quality is high or the credit risk is low. Um, so in, in relation to that they have introduced uh, an assumption that any item that has passed due more than 30 days has significantly deteriorated in, in credit quality. They have also introduced a rebuttable presumption that items that have been in arrears for more than 90 days are now in default. Uh, and in, in addition, they provide some guidance around what they uh, mean by uh, low credit risk. And they basically say that items that are still of investment grade quality um, remain of low credit risk. For the banking industry, the changes to impairment are the big things. Mm. How are the boards of banks coping with this? Well, to date they've not yet had to cope and they've been waiting for yep. the standard to come out. Uh, and we've been following these reforms since 2008 and have been asking the industry regularly about their views on the reforms and their likely impact. We have just published our fourth survey which looks at 54 global IFRS reporting banks, 18 of which are globally significantly important. And quantitatively, more than half of the banks that we survey believe that the expected loss approach 
will result in their provisions increasing by up to 50% across all loan asset classes. So that's quite a big change. Um, and there was an increasing expectation that there was a feedback loop, that banks' pricing will be affected by the accounting change. Uh, when we first asked this question, uh, very few believed there to be uh, such a loop. But now more of them are understanding the likely impact on capital, and hence the cost of capital, and hence the cost of pricing loans. On readiness, uh, there is a good level of knowledge beneath the board, um, and I think with all of the other pressures on bank boards from regulators and events, um, there's still a surprising lack of knowledge at the board level, but this is changing, um, and I think that's because the new standard is finalised and they have something to get their teeth into and they can start crunching the numbers. So how does this tie into regulatory capital? Presumably the prudential supervisors are happy with the new accounting standard? Well, they are very happy with the move from incurred to expected losses. Yeah. The uh, complaint was that bank loan loss provisioning was too little, too late. And the FSB put significant pressure, pressure on both accounting standards boards to move to the expected loss world. And so the G20 can now tick that box and say, um, we now have the standard, let's implement it. Uh, but as Andrew explained, progress has been relatively slow. Expected losses have long been used for regulatory capital calculations. So uh, the move to expected loss in accounting is obviously welcome. Um, it won't be the same model. There are different uh, levels of prudence and assumptions made in the regulatory models. Uh, the accounting rules are written for other than banks as well, so it has to be broader than just for the needs of the regulators. Um, the G20 um, wanted a converged solution between US GAAP and IFRS, but uh, that could not be reached. The two standard boards could not agree. Uh, and the US are moving on with their own model, which when compared with the IFRS expected loss model will likely lead to uh, a higher level of provision Early in, earlier in the life of the asset. So how all this ties into regulatory capital is one of the big remaining questions um, and is unfortunately a significant uncertainty for banks' capital planning. 70% uh, of the banks that we surveyed uh, anticipate that their IFRS 9 expected loss provision um, will actually be higher than their current regulatory expected loss provisions. And so that um, capital planning uncertainty will continue because we don't yet know how the regulators are going to respond to the details. We've talked about the big impact on the size of provision and regulatory planning. How easy is this going to be when it comes to implementing it on the ground? Well, our survey noted that um, key implementation challenges were around resource constraints and coordinating multidisciplinary efforts across IT and finance and risk. Um, many of the banks that we surveyed were concerned about credit data reconciliation and credit data quality and really what they're focusing on there is getting ready to use the data that they have currently used for credit risk management to produce information that will be in their published financial statements um, so that they can pass it through the same governance process and sanitise and educate people in their own organisation as well as those outside as to what it means and what it tells them um, about the quality of the, the assets on, on a bank's balance sheet. Um, clearly when you make changes that have an impact on IT systems and on uh, various functions around the organisation and have such an important impact yeah. on the reported financial information um, those, those changes are, are very difficult and, and can take some time to do, um, to, to do in, in the right way. And at the moment, because many financial institutions have a great deal of other pressures on them, be it complying with um, new regulatory requirements that are being introduced or dealing with changing business pressures and, and changing markets, 
um, finding the time and the resource to do this and to fit it in alongside all of the other things that they need to, need to do is, is going to be challenging. So we've talked about 12 month versus lifetime loss provisions. Does the standard tell you how to calculate expected losses? To, to some extent, um, there, is, there is guidance within IFRS 9 as to, as to how to do this. Um, but because the standard has been written to try to cater for um, all entities around the world, both financial and non-financial, um, and you know, particularly with the banks in many different jurisdictions, um, clearly the prescriptiveness of the guidance can only go so far so as to enable to cater for all the different situations that, that, that may occur. And so um, there is guidance in the standard about the use of probability and default, the use of other concepts like loss given default, um, and, and they have been shaped in, um, to a significant degree um, by consultation with the banking industry um, and, and other market participants uh, to try to make sure that um, as much of the guidance that is in there as, as possible is consistent with um, concepts and practices that are already employed within banking institutions. However, the level of judgment as to um, how to interpret certain key aspects of the rules, so for example, how to determine when there has been significant deterioration in credit risk, um, is, is very, very complicated. Other decisions that need to be made around how to group certain financial assets and, and, and how to um, use the external information that's available and the internal information to come to a decision about um, judgments that can be some years um, away into the future in terms of your expectations about those cash flows is inherently very, very judgmental. Um, and so whilst the guidance in the standard should help to uh, achieve a certain level of consistency and provide a framework in which banks can explain what they have done, the degree of judgment and the degree um, to which they will have to um, make their own decisions about how to calculate expected losses is, is very significant. And of course, this is not converged with US GAAP. No, unfortunately mm -hmm. not, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and in our latest survey, over half of the banks were disappointed at a lack of a converged solution. Um, that is, for investors, you know, confusion. Yeah. Um, but also, as IFRS banks with US operations or US banks with IFRS reporting subsidiaries um, have to do these things twice. And that is inefficient and uh, is quite intensive in systems and yeah. process and accounting review and that's a, a headache for, for preparers. Um, banks really also wanted this single solution so there is comparability across the whole sector. Uh, the FASB is expected to publish its financial instruments reform soon uh, and impairment is also based, will be based on expected losses, uh, but they won't have the stage one uh, as we discussed earlier. It'll just be lifetime expected losses for everything. Um, and on classification, they considered the IFRS 9 approach, but have since backed away from that, and instead of making targeted changes to their existing standards. On hedge accounting, uh, they are far apart and there are no plans to converge. So um, for us as auditors and advisors, for the regulators, the lack of convergence uh, remains a disappointment. Thank you for that. Um, what other areas of the standard do we want to talk about and just explain? Well, it's probably worth mentioning transition. Uh, so just going back to what I said at the start, there is an effective date of the 1st of January 2018. Uh, so that is for calendar year ends. Uh, we'll begin on the 1st of January 2018. Now, the uh, transition date depends on whether you're going to restate comparatives or not. So there is an option to restate comparatives. So those that choose to restate comparatives will be required to restate the comparatives, obviously for the 2017 numbers. Now, whether you choose to do that is clearly a free choice. However, certainly the feedback we got from our survey was there was a feeling, I guess, certainly among many banks, particularly the larger ones, that if, say, their peers went to restate comparatives, they would feel certainly the pressure to restate comparatives as well. So there is an option, but there is clearly, it'd be interesting to see what the market does. Uh, the other aspect is whether uh, regulators may actually require this information early, perhaps in an unaudited basis. Um, so although 2018 seems quite a long way off, if you're restating 2017, really you've only got two full uh, financial years 
in order to get your numbers straight for the 1st of Jan 2017. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew, Mark and Tom. Um, all four of the IFRS banking surveys and other resources on IFRS 9 can be found on iesplus.com. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.